in our headlines on this Friday afternoon, August 4th, here in South Korea. For the first time in history, the country's disaster response headquarters operates at level 2 against a heat wave as torturous temperatures raise the number of heat-related incidents nationwide. Also, authorities have in place tangible support measures to ease the plight of the World Scout Jamboree, whose participants are braving brutal temperatures at the sweltering campsite of the global event. Meanwhile, President Yusuf Gyal condemns a brutal knife attack against 14 bands and people at a shopping center in the Greater Seoul area and calls for all-out efforts to ensure public safety. Seoul's Interior Ministry has raised the level of the country's emergency response to the record-breaking heat wave currently suffocating the country. Our Ian Jin starts us off. On Thursday, as of 5 p.m., the South Korean government raised the level of emergency operations to the second highest, level 2, in response to the nationwide scorching heat. The Ministry of the Interior and Safety said the new level was initiated as over 108 regions across the country were expecting temperatures to reach over 35 degrees Celsius for the next three days. This is the first time in the disaster headquarters history that operation has been raised to level two due to a heat wave. The agency has three emergency duty stages to prepare against disaster or crises with level three being the highest. After this summer's monsoon season, South Korea has been coping with searing heat for over a week. The country's four-level heat alert has been raised to the highest level of red on Tuesday for the first time in four years. Daytime highs hovered in the mid-30s nationwide, with temperatures rising as high as 38 degrees Celsius on Thursday. The government announced its commitment to alleviating problems related to the heat wave by allocating 6 billion won, or 4.61 million U.S. dollars, as part of its emergency response. Now, according to the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, 89 people were hospitalized due to the heat on Thursday, and there were two fatalities which were presumed to be heat-related. The number of people treated for heat-related illness reached 1,385 on Wednesday from May 20th with those aged 65 and above taking up around 29 percent of the figure. Amid the scorching heat, the KDCA also said around 165,000 units of livestock, including 156,297 chickens, died due to the heat since June 19th. Ian Din, Arirang News. Also, in related news, Prime Minister Han Dok Su convened a cabinet meeting earlier on this Friday to convey a presidential call for all out efforts to support scouts partaking in the global rally at Semangum, where reports of heat related incidents have been rampant. My colleague Moon Heryan reports. With nearly 1,000 teenagers at the World Scout Jamboree being struck down by heat-related illnesses, South Korea's Prime Minister has led an emergency cabinet meeting to discuss contingency measures against the heat wave. At the meeting which took place on Friday morning, he highlighted the importance of responding as quickly as possible despite the unexpectedness of the situation, and reiterated President Yoon Sagar's instructions. The president has instructed that the scouts should be provided with as many air-conditioned buses and cold water supplies as needed, and that the quality and amount of food provided should be improved immediately. All efforts should be taken by all government ministries to fix these on-site issues. The meeting discussed how the government's newly announced funds to tackle heatwave-related issues across the country should be spent, with half the 4.6 million U.S. dollar budget to be used on providing additional cooling facilities, emergency supplies and air-conditioned shuttle buses at the World Scout Jamboree. The Minister of Health and Welfare also visited the temporary hospital set up at the Jamboree to evaluate the situation and listen to the medical staff's concerns as well as taking note of what additional support they might need. Earlier this morning, the government and the ruling People Power Party declared that plans were underway to provide enough ice water for 100,000 people on site, as well as providing cooling tents and expanding electricity supply capacity. It will also be explaining these plans to foreign media outlets and diplomats from participating countries, while also remaining well aware of the concerns of the scouts' parents at home. The Defence Ministry has already sent out around a dozen personnel for medical support, but plans to dispatch 30 more later today, as well as setting up shelters and shower facilities for the scouts. 36 ambulances will be on standby during the hottest hours of the day between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. 
With the event being a global one with participants from 158 countries, countries with participating scout delegations are also closely following the situation. The UK contingent is the largest, with 4,500 scouts out of the total 43,000 participants, and a Foreign Office correspondent said it was in communication with both Scouts UK and Korean authorities to ensure the safety of British nationals. Moon Hyeryeon, Arirang News. And the plight of farmers nationwide continues as alarming levels of seasonal torrential downpours are followed by record-breaking heat waves and forecasts of a typhoon in the days ahead. Our Shin Sebyeok has more. Eggplants scattered all over the ground. These vegetables have withered under the high temperatures that have gripped South Korea. Farmers try to shield them from the heat, but it barely helps. The intense heat has caused the eggplants to lose their natural color, which impacts their quality and how many a farmer can sell. This year's yield is only 60 percent of what it was last year. And of those, seven out of ten boxes contain lower quality produce. It's been a double whammy for the farmers as the damage has only worsened after the monsoon season. This year, extreme heat came right after the heavy rain, leaving the eggplants struggling to adapt and grow properly. Soybeans are also feeling the impact. The same farmer has had to plant soybeans five times this year, much more than usual, and most of them have wilted early. Even those that managed to grow cannot fully ripen, falling victim to the relentless heat. It's not just the crops and vegetables that are struggling. Cattle are finding it tough to cope with the sweltering conditions. Farmers are trying to keep their cattle cool by running air conditioning units nonstop. With this scorching weather, you can see a significant drop in the cattle's appetite. And it's not just that, it's also noticeably affecting their fertility rates. Such extreme heat is deadly for farm animals. Exposure to extreme temperatures could result in heat stress and eventually death. According to the Ministry of the Interior and Safety, as of August 1st, over 150,000 farm animals have died due to the heat wave this summer. The fully fledged typhoon season is expected soon, adding to the farmers' worries. The doors fear that the damage will escalate, and so farmers are bracing themselves for what's to come. Shin se Arirang News. In other news now, a pair of unrelated yet equally unsettling knife assaults against people at large have left the greater Seoul area in much anxiety. And accordingly, President Yoon Suk-yeol has called for an unrelenting stance against acts of public atrocity. Our presidential office correspondent Kim do reports. Fourteen people were injured, with two of them said to be in a critical condition as of Friday afternoon following an attack at a shopping mall in Pundang, Gyeonggi-do province the evening before. The suspect, who appeared to randomly attack people with a knife at the department store after he had first crashed his vehicle into people at the storefront, is a 22-year-old man with the surname Che, was detained by the police at the scene. According to the police report, Che was incoherent as he was escorted away, and local reports have confirmed that he had been diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder a few years before. The incident comes just 13 days after a random knife attack in Chilindong in western Seoul, where an attacker killed one man and injuring three others. Following that incident, there had been a number of threats posted on social media regarding a similar attack, with police already arresting a number of people for posting such threats. But the latest knife attack in Pundang has added fuel to the fire. Overnight, more knife attack threats were made online, targeting popular places such as Uijangbu City in Gyeonggi-do province and Seomyeon in Busan. The nation's police is on full alert, with units deployed at locations mentioned in the threats. In the meantime, President Yoon Song yeol labeled the latest knife attack a terrorist attack on innocent citizens. This is the first time he's labeled an incident like this as a terrorist attack. He had referred to the knife attack in Shilim as a violent crime. According to a statement by the top office, President Yoon ordered the police to mobilize its full force to make sure people do not feel threatened. He also told the Interior and Safety Minister to make sure officers are deployed to appropriate locations to respond to any possible attacks. 
He also said they should be equipped with effective and powerful right control gear. Kim Do Young, Arirang News. North Korea has confirmed custody of American soldier Travis King, who bolted across the border last month while on a guided tour. According to the BBC, the regime has made its first response to requests for information by the UN command on Mr. King's whereabouts. Now, no more details have been shared amid fears of hindering efforts to ensure his safe return. Publicly, North Korea has yet to acknowledge custody of the American service member, who served at a detention center here in South Korea for over a month on assault charges and was forced to face disciplinary proceedings in the U.S. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has pleaded his innocence in response to the latest indictment against him that alleges he sought to overturn the result of the 2020 presidential election. Our Isingje Jae has details. Not guilty. That's how former U.S. President Donald Trump responded Thursday when faced with charges of conspiring to overturn his 2020 presidential election defeat. The former president attended the arraignment at a Washington courthouse located just a kilometer away from the U.S. Capitol, where his supporters stormed on January 6, 2021, in a bid to stop Congress from certifying his defeat. Trump faces a total of four charges, including conspiracy to defraud the U.S., depriving U.S. citizens of their voting rights and obstructing an official proceeding. The arraignment comes after a 45-page indictment on Tuesday, where special counsel Jack Smith accused a former U.S. leader and his allies of knowingly promoting false claims that the election was rigged while pressuring state and federal officials to alter the results of the 2020 presidential election. After his not guilty plea, Trump expressed his discontent, calling the move a political persecution. When you look at what's happening, this is a persecution of a political opponent. This was never supposed to happen in America. This is the persecution of the person that's leading by very, very substantial numbers in the Republican primary and leading Biden by a lot. So if you can't beat him, you persecute him or you prosecute him. The latest indictment marks the third for Trump in just four months. He pleaded not guilty to New York state charges that he falsified documents in connection with hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels in April, and also pleaded not guilty to federal charges that he retained classified documents after leaving office in June. However, there could be more charges for the former president, this time in the state of Georgia, as a state prosecutor is investigating his attempts to overturn the election laws there. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Also on the international front, militant organization ISIS, also known as Islamic State, confirmed on Thursday local time the death of its leader, Abu Hussein al Qurashi. According to Reuters, the announcement was made on the group's Telegram channel and revealed that the leader was killed during a battle in Syria. Now, this is reportedly the group's first official acknowledgement of the leader's death since Turkey's claim of having killed him back in April. ISIS has named Abu Hafs al-Hashimi al-Qurashi as its new leader. Oil prices jumped on Thursday in response to reports that Saudi Arabia may extend its production ceiling through September. Saudi state news agency SPA reported that the country's production for next month will be around 9 million barrels a day. Following this report, West Texas Intermediate rose some 2.5% to 81 US dollars and 50 cents on Thursday. Saudi Arabia has reduced its output by 1 million barrels a day from 10 million barrels since July. Meanwhile, members of OPEC Plus are scheduled to meet on Friday to assess the global oil market. Up next, my colleague Isu Jin shares the stories of women here who have succeeded in returning to the workforce after long breaks in career owing to motherhood and more. To take a listen. Women in South Korea who have been on long career breaks are determined to rejoin the workforce. But many, such as P. Jin Won, have trouble figuring out how to do so, partly because of the changes that occurred during their time away. 
Back when I first started working, most of the stuff was done manually. But when I came back, everything was computerized. Women's participation in the workforce shows an M-shaped curve, meaning that the percentage employed plunges for women in their 30s. And the average time that it takes for those women to find employment again has increased from 7.9 years in 2019 to 8.9 years in 2022. So how can these women return to work sooner rather than later? Women like Pijin Won are turning to job training centers dedicated to shortening women's career breaks. This government-sponsored center in Seoul is just one of 18 that offers various job training for women. P, who has taken several classes at her local job training center, hopes to start an online business. I want to feel accomplished by contributing to society before I get any older. Classes that help women earn babysitting and barista certificates, as well as ones that teach them how to start online businesses, are just some of the options available. Chongde successfully launched her own business after taking classes at one of these centers. Cho had a decade-long career gap before she started her own publishing company. She turns children's artwork and stories into books and publishes them so they can be sold at Kobo Books, the nation's biggest book chain. Children can see that their work has economic value as they can earn copyright fees from having their books sold. She says that one of the biggest perks of running her own company is that it allows her to have autonomy over her work hours. She typically works while her children are at school, and when they come home, she spends time with them and helps them with their homework. <laughs> Working from home not only saves her on rent, but makes it easier for her to do everyday tasks, such as making snacks for her kid. And her favorite time of the day is when she gets to sit down and spend quality time with her son. She says that her goal is to one day hire other women like her. I want to have a business that creates employment. She also hopes that more women get the courage and opportunity to start their own companies. But starting their own business isn't the only option available to these women who want to return to work. Their areas are facing severe workforce shortages, such as in the STEM field. Other institutions connect women on career breaks to positions in science fields and fund their research. One woman who successfully returned to work as a senior researcher through one such institution is Yang Seung. I've been able to publish SCI grade journals and do government research. I also have colleagues that have been a huge source of strength. The president of the institution that helped Yang rejoin the workforce as a senior researcher told us these women could help mitigate the STEM workforce shortage. There's expected to be a shortage of 47,000 science and technology professionals by 2028, but there are currently about 190,000 women in the science field who are experiencing career interruptions. She says that there is still much that can be done to shorten women's career breaks. We need to up the effectiveness and usage of parental leave programs and encourage more men to take parental leave. She said that it's crucial for these women to be actively supported not just by these institutions but by their families. A greater awareness of the ways these women can contribute once they return to the workforce along with the support to help them do so will ultimately benefit the economy and society as a whole. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Poland, the Prime Minister has warned of potential provocations and sabotage actions from members of the Wagner mercenary group. During a press conference in Suwaki on Thursday, Poland's Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki said that Wagner troops are moving towards a thin strip of land between Poland and Lithuania and could cross the border posing as migrants. He added that Belarus is hosting 4,000 Wagner fighters and in a separate meeting said that Poland will increase the number of troops on its eastern border. This comes two days after two Belarusian helicopters allegedly entered Polish airspace during training exercises.
Belarus denies the allegation. A bus has crashed into a ravine in western Mexico, killing at least 17 people, including three children. 22 others have been injured. According to an official, the bus on Thursday drove off a highway near the city of Tepic and crashed into a 50-meter deep ravine. It's not clear what caused the accident. The bus was carrying around 40 people and was bound for Tijuana. This comes a month after another crash in southern Mexico left 29 people dead, while 17 were killed in a crash in central Mexico in February. The group stages of the Women's World Cup came to a close with Germany crashing out of the tournament. The two-time world champions were knocked out after a 1-1 draw against South Korea in Brisbane on Thursday. Morocco beat Colombia 1-0 in Perth, meaning Morocco finished above Germany to reach the round of 16 for the first time. Germany striker Alexandra Popp said she can't comprehend Germany's exit. Morocco will face France in the round of 16, while Group H winners Colombia will face Jamaica. And finally, Somalia suspended its Athletics Federation chairwoman on Wednesday after a video went viral of a Somalian female sprinter performing poorly at the World University Games. The video taken on Tuesday shows 20-year-old Nasra Abuka trailing far behind her competitors in the 100-meter sprint, taking over 21 seconds to finish. Abuka was reportedly given the chance to compete at the Games in the Chinese city of Chengdu as she is a relative of the suspended official. Matthew Ashley, Aridang News. Good afternoon. Korea based under a searing heat wave with heat warnings remain in place in most of Korea. Gangneung had another super tropical night with temperatures staying above 30 degrees Celsius last night. An unbearable heat continued through the afternoon with an expected high of 38 degrees Celsius. And those in southern provinces need to have a small umbrella handy. 5 to 60 millimeters of sudden rain is in the forecast and it could come down hard once once it starts to rain along with thunder and lightning. However, the capital area is having more burning sunshine with an expected high of 35 degrees Celsius. Busan is also enduring intense heat, Gyeongju seeing a high of 37 degrees. Drink plenty of water even if you don't feel thirsty. Take regular breaks if you're outdoors. More passing showers are in the forecast in the south tomorrow, while high heat continues to engulf much of Korea through early next week, so please take well care. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. And those are the headlines at this hour. As always, we have our panel session coming up right after this break. Thank you for now.